my name's Abigail. Welcome to Philosophy Tube. Today, we're going to talk about Islamophobia. We're going to learn a little bit about what it is and what it does. And I'm going to conclude by saying if we want to understand it, we need to think about how people conceptualize threat. We're going to have to talk about some heavy stuff, but the video is classroom appropriate. We're going to have to mention some contemporary political issues as well. I'll be citing all my sources at the top of the screen, and I will try to be impartial. I will obviously fail because I'm human, but I will do my best for you. If you do your best too, please keep my comments section a nice place. I'm very grateful to all the Muslim script consultants I hired to help me. If you get something out of today's video, feel free to share it with someone or sign up to support me at patreon.com slash philosophytube. And now, without further ado, Dami i gospoda prodolžajti šiu. Privet, people of Great Britain, it is I, normal English lady and not Soviet secret agent, Natasha Mikhailovna Orkidectomy. Would you like to join me for normal British refreshments, cucumber sandwiches, afternoon tea, and we can talk about normal British conversation topics, the weather, the football game, transphobia. Ugh, I feel like I'm being very obvious. But what else can I do? I trained for so long to be a sleeper agent. They told me, Natasha, you will go to the West, infiltrate their society, and subvert them for the glory of the motherland. And I learned perfect English. I learned your culture. I even learned the rules of cricket. I moved my whole life to London. And two weeks later, the bloody Berlin Wall fell down. I never even got to do any spying. God, what I wouldn't give to be arrested for subversion. Nobody's worried about reds under the bed anymore. Now they're worried about someone else. The Oxford English Dictionary defines Islamophobia as, quoting the dictionary in a video essay is for hacks. The point is to gain a greater understanding of the topic, not to regurgitate words off a page. So. Story time. In 2009, a man named Shahid Hussein was hanging around outside a mosque in Newburgh, Orange County, New York, where he happened to bump into another man, James Cromarty, who was impressed by Hussein's flashy car. Cromarty was working the night shift at Walmart, and Newburgh is a town particularly blessed by the fruits of your capitalist system, so Hussein being this wealthy businessman, he stood out. Over the next year, Hussein repeatedly offered Cromarty a quarter of a million dollars, a BMW, a holiday to Puerto Rico, and his own barbershop business in exchange for committing a thing that you can't say on YouTube, which Cromarty initially refused to do. When Cromarty lost his job, however, he agreed to go along with it, but then he didn't really do anything. He strung Hussein along for months, talking the talk. Hussein told him to recruit some other guys to help, and Cromarty was like, yeah, yeah, I'm on it. I'm gonna recruit some real hard nuts, trust me. And eventually he recruited these three other guys none of whom were particularly keen, but all of whom badly needed money. Hussein masterminded this plan to plant a Feuerwerk in a car outside a synagogue in the Bronx, and then surprise a military plane with a Bolshoi Feuerwerk. Hussein supplied the money, the plan, the equipment, and the snacks, and drove the four of them to the Bronx because none of them had a car. Cromarty got out, planted the firework in the target car, didn't even switch it on, then got back into Hussein's vehicle, whereupon a hundred FBI agents jumped out and arrested everybody. It turned out that Hussein was working for the FBI the entire time. The devices were fake, the plan was fake, the snacks were real, but there was never any danger. And that's not my opinion, that's the opinion of the judge who said, 
The essence of what occurred here is that a government, understandably zealous to protect its citizens from terrorism, came upon a man both bigoted and suggestible, one who was incapable of committing an act of terrorism on his own. It created acts of terrorism out of his fantasies of bravado and bigotry, and then made these fantasies come true. The government did not have to infiltrate and foil some nefarious plot. There was no nefarious plot to foil. Only the government could have made a terrorist out of Mr. Cromarty, a man whose buffoonery is positively Shakespearean in its scope. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that there would have been no crime here except the government instigated it, planned it, and brought it to fruition. Now, being from the Soviet Union, I love a good show trial. But in the West, you have these things called entrapment laws that are supposed to protect you if the police set you up. However, if you are on trial in an American federal court and your lawyer argues entrapment, the prosecution just have to prove that you were predisposed to commit the crime. And that's easy enough. If you've done some petty crime in the past, if they bring you in under armed guard so you look very scary, if you've been recorded saying awful but legal things about soldiers or Jewish people, or if you just look like a stereotypical criminal, then a lot of jurors will go, yeah, seems like he was predisposed. And that's enough. The entrapment defense fails almost every time, as indeed it failed in United States v. Cromarty when all four defendants were found guilty and sentenced to 25 years each in an American gulag, which at time of recording, I believe they are still serving. You decadent Westerners, you think you have nothing to fear just because you didn't do anything wrong? <laughs> Oh no, my friends. If you don't commit a crime, we can simply build the crime around you. Oh, I miss the KGB. Although apparently not everyone's cut out for a career in the secret police. Terry Albury, who was an FBI agent for 17 years, was convicted of espionage in 2018 for leaking classified documents about the Bureau's methods to the press. Of course, I had already read Russian translations of those documents years ago, but to many Americans, they were quite shocking. Albury later claimed that a lot of agents get burned out and disillusioned because you join up out of a sincere desire to protect people, and then 16 years later, it's 1 a.m. and you're going through some guy's bins, reading his receipts, and you know the only thing he's done wrong is visit a mosque, and it, it's not exactly James Bond, is it? The war on terror is like this game, right? We've built this entire apparatus and convinced the world that there's a terrorist in every mosque and that every newly arrived Muslim immigrant is secretly anti-American. And because we've promoted that false notion, we have to validate it. So we catch some kid who doesn't know his ear from his ass for building a bomb fed to them by the FBI. It becomes a vicious circle, because the longer you look at a kid, the bigger the file gets, even if they've done nothing. And then six months later, somebody calls the FBI and says, I've seen some suspicious activity in this neighborhood, and an agent can see that we have thick files on all of these kids. But the question is, okay, so you have thick files on these kids, but the files have shown that these kids are guilty of nothing. So what does that actually achieve? It achieves intelligence, and that's a nebulous, wonderful sounding word that everyone likes to throw around. But based on my experience, the entire purpose of these assessments was to create a database of American Muslims. It's a very dangerous and toxic environment, and we haven't come to terms with the fact that maybe we really screwed up here. Maybe what we're doing is wrong. Now, before anyone accuses me of being some kind of secret leftist infiltrator trying to undermine the West, please note the two critics of post 9-11 security culture that I just quoted were not Marxist academics or purple-haired students, but a judge and an FBI agent. And when they're the ones saying that something's gone wrong... I mean, I am a secret leftist infiltrator, but I'm an honest one. I did try taking over the British Labour Party, but Keir Starmer foiled my schemes with his unstoppable sexual charisma. <laughs> These two stories come from the USA, but they're not the only ones. 
In the early 2000s, the vibes in many Western countries were rancid, as several political analysts have said. And these rancid vibes contributed to an atmosphere in which Muslim people were seen as potentially disloyal, suspicious, maybe even dangerous, and in need of surveillance. Reminds me an awful lot of the Cold War. Muslims, disproportionately women, were attacked in the streets, monstered in the media, many were forced into violent relationships with the state or put under pointless surveillance. A lot of people who weren't even Muslim got a hard time just because people thought that they were Muslim. And a large number of hypocritical and simplistic stereotypes about Muslims were disseminated widely. The Islamic world never had a secular enlightenment, which is why they have such a disposition towards violence. Unlike Great Britain, a peaceful society that's never been violent towards anyone. Luckily, all that's behind us now. It's definitely not still happening, and it definitely hasn't had any long-term negative consequences. <laughs> As discussed, the post-9-11 vibes were rancid. And one way of explaining these rancid vibes is to say that people were afraid and they didn't understand. And people are always afraid of what they don't understand. And in their misunderstanding, they turned to fear. And fear made them afraid of the things that they just didn't understand. And so they were lost in fear and misunderstanding and afraid of that lost in fear and misunderstanding. And so they were all turning, turning always in misunderstanding and fear and lost and lost in fear and misunderstanding. And that's why we'll always need the X-Men. <laughs> and if that's true, then the solution should be pretty easy. Let's just all be nicer to each other. Let's get to know our community better. Maybe then we'll realize we don't have to be afraid of one another. And then maybe all this intrusive security and militarized violence will just disappear. And okay, I'm being a little bit facetious here. Healing and togetherness, detente, it, it's not nothing. But we can also go deeper. Yes, people were afraid. But why did their fear take the form it did and have the effects that it did? Islamophobia didn't just start in 2001. The anti-racism think tank Runnymede Trust published a report titled Islamophobia, a problem for us all in 1997. They followed it in 2017 with the hilariously understated sequel Islamophobia, still a problem for us all. The philosopher Sarah Ahmed says that emotions are more than just individual psychological states. Society produces and prioritizes certain group emotional responses over others, and in doing so, reveals interesting things. Now that's quite an abstract point, so let me give you an example. Story time again. On Monday the 25th of July 2005, four men were renting a cottage in Haworth, West Yorkshire. They had driven up from London for a friend's wedding, and about 11.20 a.m. one of them went out to buy laundry detergent, whereupon several armed police jumped out and pinned him to the pavement at gunpoint, along with another man who just happened to be walking past. The police searched the house and the car with dogs, interrogated the men, and quickly discovered absolute no nichewa. They were completely innocent. What had happened was a local resident had seen four men, three South Asian, one white, drive up on a Sunday night with a suspicious package and go into the house. And they'd called the cops, who responded thusly. The suspicious package turned out to be a box of mangoes, delightfully, and one of the men had recently been giving lectures at Bradford University on the need for community cohesion. <laughs> 25th of July 2005 was two weeks after 7-7, so yeah, people probably were a little bit on edge. And we can go deeper and explore these emotions. Haworth is in West Yorkshire, which historically was a big centre of the textile industry. In the mid-20th century, a lot of South Asian people moved there to do the night shifts in the textile mills that white people didn't want to do. But by the 1980s, it was cheaper for your capitalist class to have people actually in Asia do textile work. So all the jobs went. 
And like a lot of the North of England, the area declined economically in a big way. And those South Asian people suddenly found they weren't always welcome anymore. So a lot of them got jobs driving taxis or opening corner shops or doing stuff where they didn't have to live and work alongside white people who might be racist towards them. As a result, parts of England remain to this day very racially segregated. Some people who've been living here longer than I have are still seen as outsiders, which may be contributed to the decisions somebody in Haworth made to call the police when they saw some South Asian guys renting a house. If you want to, you can trace this political economic dimension of emotion even further back to colonialism, as many Muslim scholars have done. When Algeria was fighting for its independence from France, the French justified their occupation in part by claiming that Muslim women were uniquely very oppressed, in particular, oppressed by wearing veils, which the colonial government banned. France banned Muslim women from wearing veils again in national territory in 2004, claiming it was for their own good. And a lot of Muslim women have objected to this pretty colonialist idea that inside every Muslim woman, there's a non-Muslim woman struggling to get out. Or the idea that Muslim women aren't aware of patriarchy and aren't capable of challenging it from within their own intellectual traditions. The body of the Muslim woman, a body fixed in the Western imaginary as confined, mutilated, and sometimes murdered in the name of culture, serves to reinforce the threat that the Muslim man is said to pose to the West and is used to justify the extraordinary measures of violence and surveillance required to discipline him and Muslim communities. The Islamic world never had a secular enlightenment, which is why they can't understand that ladies deserve to have a choice in life. Specifically, the choices that we tell them to have. Now, the response to this kind of thinking, in particular bringing up colonialism, is sometimes to say that Islam is not a race, and therefore Islamophobia can't have anything to do with racism. Islamophobia, it's just a made up word that politically correct people say to try and shut down legitimate criticism. In a free society, often uncomfortable things must be said to opposing parties to effectively work out complex issues. But when someone attempts to criticize the beliefs of a religion, mostly Islam, the left will invariably attach that criticism to racism. But racism cannot also be used for those who question the ideas of religion or their dogmas or attempt to demonstrate the relationship of religious ideas to terrorism. This only cuts off the kind of debate that has usually taken place in conversations of the liberal left. I confess, there's something about paragraphs like that which tugs at me. When I was 14, I accidentally got into the teleporter pod from The Fly with Christopher Hitchens. I'm all right now, but occasionally I just shout free speech at priests. But even as a free thinking, rational debate lord's logic brain genius, I have to defer to the evidence, which shows that anti-Muslim attitudes frequently talk, walk and quack a hell of a lot like racism. In this ABC article from 2015, sociologist Rhonda Abdel Fattah talks to several Australian people who were upset when their local supermarkets started stocking halal food. In particular, they seemed distressed and disoriented when their favorite products started carrying halal labels, as if that meant they weren't allowed to enjoy them anymore. Abdel Fattah says these people were so used to thinking of that space as for them. So used to thinking of the food on the shelves as theirs, even before they paid for it, that they perceived the presence of another perspective as a threat of potential takeover. Replacement by racial minorities has long been a nightmare in the brains of far-right racists, and Islamophobia dovetails very neatly into that. Scholar Shireen Razak says that this is clearly racial thinking. Sometimes it's full-blown racism, but often it's broader than that. It's thinking that people can be divided into essential groups based on what they look like or where their ancestors came from, and then supposing that one group of people are inherently just a bigger threat than the others which often implicitly justifies the arbitrary surveillance and violence that they're subjected to. It's worth noting that Islamophobia is often sold as being defensive, 
whether it's surveillance in the US and UK or internment camps in China or conspiracy theories in India or the big G, the big G from 1995, not GoldenEye, the, the thing that you can't say out loud on YouTube without getting demonetized. It's often sold as, well, we had to do this to protect ourselves against the threat that these people posed, even if the evidence for that threat just isn't there. Razak compares it to lynchings, which were also often sold as, or were defending the community against crime. But everyone knew that was just an excuse. It was really about violence against a racialized other. And the really insidious thing about this is that it doesn't just create a racialized other. I remember in my teenage new atheist phase reading Sam Harris's book, The End of Faith. And I was nodding along with the criticisms of religion. And then I got to the bits where he started talking about American foreign policy and even torture and saying that Islam was this big threat. And I had Muslim friends and I thought, have I skipped a chapter here? I couldn't really put my finger on it, but I got the feeling that I was missing the fine print. What I eventually came to understand is that I was being encouraged to see myself in a different way too. Muslim people were being cast as this pre-modern threat, and at the same time, I was being offered the role of the rational, intelligent, suspicious, cautious, hard-nosed, really facing up to the tough problems, asking the tough questions. Really, I'm brave for saying it. I'm defending the legacy of the enlightenment that my country embodies, the, the legacy that I am the heiress to. I am... I... Um... I pride myself on being a fair-minded person. I was raised in a very conservative, religious household. My brother was always encouraged to go out into the world and pursue his dreams of being a door-to-door -door petrol salesman. But I was expected to enter the caring professions, and it took no small amount of courage to defy that expectation. I was heartbroken by the news of this awful fire, such a beautiful building, a symbol of the old world, of culture and tradition. I saw the smoke from my window and I wished, God, how I wished that there was something I could do. Of course, everyone's on edge in this current climate because of these terrible arson attacks that have been happening all over. It's not clear yet whether this is connected, but as a journalist, I have a duty to follow the truth wherever it leads, even if that truth is uncomfortable. I can't help but wonder why were so many barrels of petrol being stored in that particular building? What were they planning on using them for? Somebody must have known. Why did nobody speak out? Is it possible that this building was being used as a central distribution center of sorts? Now that's the kind of question that the anti-fire work brigade would probably call incendiary. But that is exactly the kind of silencing remark that needs to be stamped out. It takes an awful lot of courage to speak up when you're expected to wished, especially for women and girls. I don't know what sorts of things were taught in that building every Friday, and neither do the police, but I can't help but wonder whether the women and girls who were sent there were encouraged to speak their minds, and whether some of them might still be with us today, had they felt able to say something about the many unmarked barrels of incendiary liquid that just happened to be delivered only days before. My brother said it would take an awful lot of intelligence to deliver so many barrels of petrol to that particular door without anyone seeing. He just happened to be walking past right as the fire started. 
Our friends, the police, are pursuing every possible lead. Those of us on the side of reason and understanding need to be open to all theories. But I suppose, if you'd been taught all your life not to ask questions, to accept the sacred command, reason might not be your strong suit. I suppose they can't help it. It's just their nature. The philosopher Richard Jackson says that after 9-11, counter-terrorism strategy had a real crisis. Because instead of investigating crimes that we actually have evidence for, security services started introducing preemptive measures to tackle crimes that might happen. That's why agents like Terry Albury ended up spying on people who overwhelmingly never did anything wrong. Instead of spying on me! The trouble is that what might happen is infinite. Aliens might invade tomorrow. We might find out that we're living in a simulation or that sexy communists have infiltrated your government. There's zero evidence for any of that. But there was also zero evidence that James Cromarty was breaking the law until somebody decided to make that evidence. Part of the problem was that after 9-11 and 7-7 in the West, people obviously wanted to know why these traumatic things had happened, but the explanations often weren't very good. In analyzing post 9-11 media, friend of the show, Lindsay Ellis, points out that in the immediate aftermath, there was a strong push to say something even if it wasn't particularly edifying or coherent. The list of things that were politically acceptable to say quickly proved to be quite short. You were allowed to say that terrorists hate our freedoms, that they are evil slash mad, and you were allowed to blame it on religion. Free speech! But if you talked about the disenfranchisement and the aggressive foreign policy and the racism that alienates many people from society and motivates a tiny number to commit terrible violence, if you said that a heavy-handed response was likely to give ammo to the worst people on both sides of that response. In other words, if you looked at terrorism the way academics do, as a mode of political expression, however unjustifiable and horrific, you could quickly find yourself on the receiving end of a nasty backlash. Answers to the questions of what drives this process are to exclude ascribing any causative role to the actions of Western governments or their allies in other parts of the world. Instead, individual psychological or theological journeys, largely removed from social and political circumstances, are claimed to be the root of the cause of the radicalization process. While some accounts acknowledge politics as a component, using euphemistic phrases such as grievances against real or perceived injustices, this is only ever done in the face of overwhelming empirical evidence before they quickly move on to the more comfortable ground of psychology or theology. How a government makes sense of political violence directed against it usually tells us at least as much about the nature of that government as it does about the nature of its violent opponents. The French philosopher Etienne Belibar says we need to understand all this in the context of your government's failure to solve other problems. Take Britain, for example. Without getting political about whose fault it is, there are definitely problems. Food shortages, job shortages, energy shortages, medicine shortages, massive economic inequality, millions of children living in poverty, hundreds of thousands of people using food banks, hundreds of thousands of people sleeping on the streets. There's an entire demographic of the population who are routinely denied life-saving medical care. Less than 2% of rape cases result in charges. The climate reaper is breathing down our necks. We didn't have the supplies we needed to deal with COVID. We didn't have the manufacturing capacity to make the supplies we needed. And over 130,000 people are now stone cold dead. Don't look at me. I haven't done any communist subversion since I got here. Boy, I sure wish somebody would write a best-selling series of sci-fi novels about the epistemological and political crisis of Western liberalism following 9-11. And if you were feeling particularly pessimistic, you might well ask, given these problems, at what point do we say that Britain is a failed state? 
I am putting on the Joker makeup. I am putting on the Guy Fawkes mask. I am putting on the combination Joker makeup and Guy Fawkes mask. What Balibar suggests is that as long as the government is still seen as capable of responding to threats, the party's still on. As long as the lights are on and the cops are still wearing uniform, the revolution hasn't come yet. So if you're an agent of a collapsing system, it's in your interests to find a problem that you think you can deal with, make it look very, very big, and fight it in spectacular fashion. That way, you look powerful and competent, even as things continue to get worse on your watch. The state demonstrates, at low cost, the force that it claims to hold, and at the same time, reassures those who suspect its destitution. National citizens can be persuaded that their rights do in fact exist if they see that the rights of foreigners are inferior, precarious, or conditioned on repeated manifestations of allegiance. Now, it's important to remember that this is not a conspiracy. The Home Secretary is not sitting around looking at the climate data going, oh, better give the migrants another kicking. If you remember my video on ideology a while ago, you'll recall that a lot of politics is hidden in the stuff that we just don't think about. So rather than spend money tackling the political and economic causes of disenfranchisement that leads some people to feel like criminal violence is their only option, huge amounts of resources get plowed into surveillance and war. Islamophobia supplies a particular understanding of threat and so it fills a political vacuum at a time when real explanations and answers are simply The Islamic world never had a secular enlightenment, which is why they're facing so many awful problems. Unlike Great Britain, a country whose problems will they'll just sort themselves out. <laughs> it's fine here. We love it. Ha! Britain! Ha! Ha! Everything's fine. Oh, I say, do you smell smoke? By the way, if you have ever wondered how Philosophy Tube is made, then I have some good news for you. We are working, slowly, on a behind the scenes documentary about how the show comes together and what my process is. That documentary is being made with the support of Curiosity Stream. You've probably heard of them. They're a subscription streaming service. They've got thousands of titles about nature and history and science. It's kind of like what I do, but without all of the <laughs> all of the silliness. And when that documentary is done, it will be out on Nebula. Nebula is a platform that I and a few other creators all own a little piece of, like Lindsay Ellis is on there and Legal Eagle is on there. And we're making exclusive content for Nebula so that we have somewhere with no adverts and no demonetization to try out things that might not necessarily work on YouTube. It's just been nominated for a Streamy Award too, which, hey. And if you sign up to Curiosity Stream, then you get Nebula included for free. But wait, there's more. If you go to curiositystream.com slash philosophy tube, then you can get 26% off Curiosity Stream as well. That means you get them and Nebula for $15 a year. A year. I have no idea how they can afford that, but apparently they can. So as research for this episode, I watched a couple of documentaries on Curiosity Stream about the history and architecture of famous mosques, which was genuinely sick as hell. Like I really enjoyed watching it. It was cool. So click the link in the doobly-doo or go to curiositystream.com slash philosophy tube.